Wow. I don't know about you guys, but I feel an incredible peace. You know, when today's Daily Word, June's reading, Psalm 23, her prayer, she said in there that about our spiritual journey. Well, I titled this talk, um, I think right here, just a few minutes ago, because I really didn't have a talk title. I had a couple ideas, and, and it's all about the spiritual journey. I'm going to give you a, a, basically a vision I had a few years ago. A few years ago, I was in a book study up in Encinitas with Sherry and Jordan and a handful of others. And we were actually going to start a church, and I wanted another woman to be the pastor. And they kind of turned and said, no, you're going to be the pastor. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. We actually started this Bible 1C3, and we were going to start a church. And then I'm like, I'm not ready for this. And uh, all sorts of things happened. And then I was called to go to Unity Village, which sat well with me because I knew that I... There's a scripture in the Old Testament that's been coming up in my mind for the last couple of weeks, and it's, it's kind of bizarre, but it's he, he teacheth my hands to war. Spirit, if we allow, if we surrender spirit, we are trained how to move in the spiritual journey. The spiritual journey is, is different. Now, I grew up as an athlete, and I was always that guy that if I got into something, I got into something. You know, I would... I would interview the winners, and I would say, how do you train? What do you do? I wanted to know. I didn't want to waste my time at the back of the pack. I wanted to get to the front of the pack, and I wanted to win. I just wanted the full possible experience of what could be. I think I've shared before, at 10 years old, I started interval training. I would sprint from one telephone pole to the next, and then I would jog, and then sprint to the... How many 10-year-olds are doing that? You know, it's just... But I was a speed skater, and I knew it was a lot more fun to get a trophy than to not get a trophy. And so I liked getting trophies. So anyhow, that, now we move on and in the spiritual arena, it's not all grit and determination and ego, or is it? There's a relationship that we have. I love the field of transpersonal psychology. It's that boundary between psychosis, our psyche, and spirit. It's this integration. It's a trust. Because if our, if our psyche, if our ego trusts the Holy Spirit, then it'll surrender. Because, have you seen that, that Indiana Jones movie where he's got to save his dad and he's got to walk across this thing and he can't see it? It just looks like a, you know what I'm talking about? And he steps out and, oh, oh, you know, it is there. He couldn't see it. But in faith and trust, he stepped out there. And the spiritual journey is like this. Well, this vision I had a few years ago, it was back in the, the days before I went to seminary. And I, um, it was really cool, but it's very visual. Imagine that it's like a huge plateau. Everything's flat, but it's kind of rocky. And then there's this ridge line that's just completely perpendicular to another ridge line that goes this way, but flat. And then there's this, this narrow area where you have to walk through. And, and it was just shown to me that that was the beginning of the spiritual journey. When I walked away from this comfort, cushy plateau onto this narrow pathway, ah, I have started my spiritual journey. The evangelicals would call that salvation. That was the moment I surrendered my life to Christ, okay? So... Um, then as, it's like this, it's a great, now everybody has to be barefoot. I don't know why it was the vision, but everybody's barefoot and the ridge line is smooth because millions and millions of people have walked this path. But the further you go, the steeper it gets and the, the characteristic change, you're above the tree level. But you can look down on each side of this ridge line and you can see trees and you can see that there are houses nestled in the trees. And there's the cute little houses and little fires coming out the chimney. And people have settled in to a nice life. They're comfortable. You know, they've got their salvation. They're in communion with God and they're cool. But then there are those, for, for whatever reason, that continue on the path. 
the path gets steeper. And then there's, this, there's a little peak, and then the, the characteristics change. It's a, it's a different level of consciousness. The phenomena are a little bit different. The characteristics of the psyche have adapted and have surrendered more real estate to the spirit. And so a person is a generally a little more kind, a little more flexible, a little more tolerant as this journey continues. And then as you notice that the ridgeline, there are fewer and fewer people have walked this, this ridgeline. And so uh, on this rock ridge, it gets a little less smooth because fewer feet have worn the path down. So you continue on in this path, and, and it's like the next little mini peak, it, it, it gets a little steeper, and, and you're in the realm of, of uh, intellectualism, if you will. Um, so uh, erudition, education, excellence, reason, logic is this next paradigm that you go through. And it is steeper. It's more difficult to hike than the other hikes before. And people are creative, Okay, now the next, the next precipice is really important because there's an area where the peak goes vertical and you have no tools, no ropes, no equipment. It's impossible to get there. You, you have to ascend this peak. The next peak is nonlinear. It's the realm of love. And, and it occurred to me that I had to turn around. I had to surrender all the education, all the reason, all the logic I had ever had. I had to surrender it. Didn't have to walk away from it and detach myself from it, but I had to let it go. And I had to stand on this last peak at the beginning, and I just dove. And I became a javelin. And I. And as I got up to the peak, then I came out of the javelin and I landed like this. And it was a total faith thing and a letting go of reason and logic that brought me to a nonlinear place and a, and a realm of love. And I say me, I was the character in it that this was unfolding to. So it's the spiritual journey. It's, it's a generic path, okay? Makes sense? But in that realm, now 2 plus 2 could equal 6 or 8 or whatever. It was nonlinear. You didn't have to be limited to the, the reasonable logic of arithmetic or whatever. Because there was a... There was a characteristic nature of the Holy Spirit that was with you, accompanying you. You set your intentions. You know, in, in New Thought we teach you set your intentions, you focus on these, and in spirit you see these things come into being. You don't pray from a place of lack, you pray from a place of seeing it, seeing the truth, the capital T. This is where I'm going, this is what I see, this is what we are. Thank you God for this. So this nonlinear realm is very empowering, very empowering. Then it goes beyond Newtonian altogether. It's, it's, uh, it's the realms of enlightenment and stuff. And, and I don't understand that stuff. But there's a, there's a place where the path continues on. It gets really steep. Um, and then there's this precipice, and at the edge of the precipice, beyond that lies the void. And if you try to do the thing again, you end up in the void. But that's not the final destination. The final de destination is the allness. Now, think, now again, this is only for those that feel called to be on this path. It's okay to be in the houses, in the tree line, settled in and content in communion with with the divine. In a local church, we have all of this in one community. We have people that are happy and content with where they're at. And contentment is really important. If you have a, <clears throat> a nice, integrous relationship in the Holy Spirit, you don't need to go on. You're welcome to sit and stay. Some are called to be teachers. Some are called to be pastors, evangelists, apostles, prophets, you know, the whole thing in, in the New Testament. And for those that are, that are called on, their path is a little different. It's narrow, it's disciplined, it's focused. There's something from a, a quote in this book, Discovery of the Presence of God by Doc Hawkins that I love. The nine central elements 
operationally the central elements of a seriously committed inner spiritual pathway are this. One, discipline of focus without deviation. You know, a race car driver really needs to be focused on the road. They need to be looking through the turn for dangers. So when you're setting up for a turn over here, you need to be looking at the corner exit to see if there's any hazards. You need to be looking ahead. You gotta have your vision down. You only check the mirrors when you're in traffic and you got somebody on you. Second, willingness to surrender all desires and fears to God. The Buddha said the three poisons are ignorance, attachments, and aversions. So cravings and fears. By surrendering all these to God, one moves on. Willingness to endure transitory anguish until the difficulty is transcended. You know, I talk about when we go into our shadows, when we go into our pain, if we can just sit with our pain, if we can sit with it until the sting of the pain goes away, then we can experience healing. The only way through something is to go through it. Does this make sense? You know, if we avoid that which is painful, we'll never get over it. For the rest of our lives, that thing will control us that we're afraid of. We'll absolutely have control. I took karate for a few years because of this bully that I went to high school with. And by the time I got really good, he stopped grabbing me and being cocky. I think he sensed that I was waiting for him. I was waiting for him. Anyhow, constancy and watchfulness. You know, the, I did a talk last week in Overland Park, and, and I, I've touched on that theme multiple times here. No kickstands. Remember the day of Pentecost was 50 days after Easter, let's say? I did a talk on uh, the day of Pentecost last year, and in those 50 days, people had to wait. 120 people waited for Jesus in that upper room. And of course, my mind goes to, I hope they had a bathroom nearby. But, you know, those were the guys that were on that path. These are the 120. They weren't the 12, but the 12 were a part of that. But the 120 were the people that as soon as they punched out from, you know, what did Fred Flintstone work? Bedrock? Uh, I don't know. So anyhow, as soon as they punched off the clock, they were there. They were looking for Jesus, trying to find him, trying to listen and, and hear that truth. They, they were on the path. So these 120 were completely devoted. They were moving from a place of self-interest as a participant experiencer to the witness observer. They were giving up identifying as a victim and they wanted to see the big picture and say, oh, it's my story that I'm a, a whiner here. Well, if I can just let go of being a whiner and see the big picture that this is an evolutionary path that I'm moving on, I can let go of being my victim, my story, and I can move on. I can see that, that this is a process that's showing me my fears and my cravings. When these things are, re are revealed to me, then I can do something about it. Life on earth is perfect. We want to change the earth. Well, it gives us the opportunity to see our addictions and our fears and to move away from those. I don't want to get into politics. Oh Lord, I don't want to get into politics. So, we're all over this, this journey. You know, I believe we've all crossed that initial transition point. And if you haven't, you know, just surrender to Christ at any time and you're, you're on the journey. But I'm assuming everybody here has at some point in their life surrendered. And then that, like Charles Fillmore said, there's that initial awakening. And then we become a serious spiritual student and then we mature to the point to where we become in oneness with God, at one moment, atonement. Uh, we become one with the Holy Spirit. Just a few minutes before service, you know, Judy and I got together and prayed and, you know, all of a sudden as we were praying, I just felt this huge sense of peace. <sighs> just let go. Any anxiety. Guys, we have that at any moment. But if we have a kickstand where we need to rely on something outside of us, we're, we're in trouble. Jesus said, it's good that I go away, that the comforter may come that will remind you of everything I've ever said. So how many of you know there, 
I mean, what happened on the day of Pentecost is really a mind blower, if you really think of it. We could talk about that some other time. But those people were radically transformed and had extremely high consciousness and very powerful ministries. There were a lot of miracles and healings and that stuff still happens today. But the only kickstand that is cool to have, and thank you Sally for the prop, I borrowed Sally's meditation bench, but this is the best kickstand you could ever have. And to rely on your own relationship in Christ, not to rely on Unity Church of El Cajon, or not to rely on outside meetings and groups. And outside meetings and groups are important. But if you don't have communion with the divine, your higher power are other people. And other people are going to let you down. If you're in Christ, in Holy Spirit, in God, whatever you want to call it, alone, first and foremost, if you're in your communion with the divine, you cannot fall. And if you do fall, it's just a temporary setback. When you look at the big picture, but I just want to say that we're all at different places. But the one thing that we share on our journey is that we have our own built-in kickstand. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit within. You know, the, the burning bush that Moses experienced was really within. Moses, it says, was the most humble man that had ever lived. And it, and it requires humility to make space for Christ within. Pride will push it out. Arrogance will push it out. Devotion opens that hole in our heart that surrender then allows the presence, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to reside. And then we, we, we soften all the other noise in our lives and we go in so that we can experience that silence, that beautiful silence that we had when uh, June led us through the meditation this morning. That's perfect. So I encourage everybody... You can get a bench, a, a, a sofa. I like a sofa myself a lot. I, and I used to make benches. I made a bunch of them. But I just encourage everybody to go in inside, experience your oneness with the Christ, the Holy Spirit, and live to your highest potential. Wherever you decide to end up on this journey, that's okay. That's okay. It's all good. We... The, the, we're, we are a body of Christ. We can't all be elbows. It would be really weird looking. That's right. So, okay. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. God, thank you so much that the experience of the presence of God is available and within at all times, but awaits our choice. God, we bless this morning. We bless every soul here. We're so grateful. So grateful for this journey. Thank you, God, that we can have the support of this community to help one another out. Thank you, God. Amen.